going to I'm going to talk about something related but a little bit more complex and that is about the physics of software. So we often think about software development as a kind of a, a magical process. It's a bit like going to church where you read this stuff and you learn this stuff and then you repeat this stuff like a mystical statement of the more you know the more expert you are. Which of course is not science. Science is where you try stuff, it fails, you try to not blow up the house or the kitchen and if it succeeds you keep what you've you know, what you've learned, and most experiments are failures. And of course you start with problems, and that was the talk of last year. But if you take the concept of physics a little bit further, then what I've written is that the physics of software is the physics of people. That's to say, how we think, how we organize, is key and central to how we make our systems. And that's really the core of my talk today. So I was looking at some interesting laws, because we live in this natural you know, this universe of laws, and there are laws like Newton's three laws of motion. Who knows Newton's three laws of motion? Anybody? What's the first law of motion? Newton's first law. Inertia. If you don't push somebody, they won't move. We all wake up for a reason. We all go to work for a reason. And the inertia of our existence is that if we're not actually motivated economically, we won't make software. That's rule number one. Rule number two, Newton's second law. Moving more people is harder than moving a few people. So your force, acceleration, mass, right? So the resulting force divided by the mass gives you your actual acceleration. That means that you can move small teams faster than you can move large teams. In fact, you can't move very large teams. They're just like Im you know, huge immobile objects. The third law, reaction. If you push someone, they'll push back, right? So when you go into a team or if you're doing anything and you're having some kind of a change, you'll get reaction. Okay, this is not very profound, this is just like pop science, but these are fun to throw around. Now, we have the third, the third three Newton's laws, then we have the equivalence principle. You can't tell gravity from acceleration. A project could be moving forwards, or it could be falling to the ground. It looks the same. So change, for its own sake, is indistinguishable from failure. This is interesting, because we're so obsessed by moving, we forget that you can move acceleration or gravity towards the ground, smashing into little pieces. The next law is the uncertainty principle. I like that one. The more you know about one thing, the less you know about something else. So never trust experts. Because experts are very, very ignorant about everything they don't know. It's not their expertise. And if you're studying software and you're practicing software, it's a bit like languages or music or actually anything. It's, the more different areas you will work in, the more you will know about everything. Avoid specialization except as a, as a temporary thing. And experts fall into this gap of the uncertainty principle. Okay. Then we have the law that we love, of course, the law that affects us here in the conference is Murphy's Law. Hey, Boyana. <laughs> Hasn't gone wrong. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And the real Murphy's Law says it will go wrong at the, in the worst possible way at the worst possible time. What that means in practice is that systems will fail. Parts of systems will fail. You can't avoid failure. Failure will happen. And failure will happen in your software. It will happen in your organizations. And rather than trying to avoid failure and trying to prevent failure, you should learn techniques, which we'll discuss today, about embracing failure and actually using failure as part of your process. And failure becomes an essential part rather than an exceptional thing. OK? Murphy's Law. After Murphy's Law, we have, we have something called Zapf, Z Zipf's Law. Who knows Zipf's Law? It's a, it's a mathematician. No, a few people. Power distribution. 80% of your time will be spent on 20% of your code. You can't avoid that. This is the way the nature works. It's like saying 20% of the people will own 80% of the wealth. It's just the way the world works. So when you look at systems, big systems, understand that this is an unequal distribution of power. Always will be and accept that, and we'll work with that. OK, so that's seven laws. Now, those are just to throw away and to play with. The three that I actually care about, the ones that really matter, are Moore's Law, Amdahl's Law, and Conway's Law. OK, so Moore's Law is really important. And it's, it's a specific statement of a more general principle that I call cost gravity. And if you've read my book on culture and empire, you know what I mean by cost gravity. Things get cheaper over time. And any uh, technological goods get cheaper over time as knowledge spreads through a system. You can't prevent that except by using, by force. 
what that means is that the number of moving pieces in our systems will keep growing. Every two years it will double. This is very important for our business because we're in the, we're in the business of making these pieces intelligent and getting them to talk together, essentially. How many people here work on completely standalone applications? Nobody, okay. <laughs> Last year or a few years ago, there were still a few people doing this. Like I'm writing this, this thing which is completely standalone. It's running on a, on a Raspberry Pi and it's monitoring my, my, you know, my radiator or something. But even today, radiators are smart and talking to other radiators and discussing the average temperature, whatever they're doing. So we're, we're no longer in the world of standalone software and we're no longer in the world of standalone work. We used to be able to make software, produce software, sell software as the work of individuals or small teams. That's finished. So the consequence of Moore's law and cost gravity is that we, we and our systems and software we make and our organizations are more and more and more interconnected and interdependent. The number of people that you actually will work with in one way or another will keep doubling every two years until you hit you know, world population, where everybody is your client or your supplier in the whole world, one way or another. Think about that. So we used to work in little laboratories. We used to work in isolation. We used to work like our computers in, in, in small units and then produce the result and sell it, and that was it. Today we work in these growing, growing networks, and it's unavoidable. This is, these are the laws of our universe affecting us. Okay. Now, these networks, our software, our organizations are affected by the cost of sharing knowledge. Now we come to Amdahl's law. So Amdahl was a computer designer for IBM. He went off and made supercomputers and he observed quite quickly that there was a limit to how, how far you could add cores to a, to a process. And it's quite straightforward. If you have a process which is 90% parallel and 10% serial, let's just say that the, the, the processors must at some point stop and do some serial work, which is you know, agreeing on something, consensus, then the maximum speed up is 10. After 10 cores, it won't go any faster. If you're, if you're doing 50% serial, 50% parallel, then your maximum team size is two people. I mean, your, your effective team size. If you have 100 people, they will not work faster than two. This is very important for organizations because it means that if you can eliminate serial work, and I'll, I'll explain what that means in a second. You can actually scale. And if you can't, you will have a ceiling where you can't scale. You can't add more people to a team if you have to stop and get some kind of agreement before you can work. And again, Amdahl's law is, a, is an observation of a natural phenomena. It doesn't matter how rich you are, you still have to obey these laws, right? There's no arguing with these laws of nature. And then we come to Conway's law. And Conway's law is the one I like because it kind of puts us all together it says that the software we make reflects the way we organize. The two are really expressions of the same thing. It's a very old observation. Uh, if you have a, a team of five people writing a compiler, you'll have a four-pass compiler. It's an old joke, because one person has to be in charge. So the work divides to fit the number of people. They work together, and they build a thing with the shape of the team. What this means is that to make a certain shape of software, you must make a certain shape of organization. If you want to build a very effective, large-scale, decentralized, distributed application or, or set of applications or software ecosystem or whatever it is, then that must be the structure of your organization. If you're a heavily centralized, I would say old-fashioned organization with uh, central planning, and central budgeting and central decision making, then what you make will look like that. It will be software with very heavy centralization, with top down decision making. And if you are a loosely organized coalition of teams working on problems and choosing your own work and organizing competitively in a kind of a market, an economic market, the software you make will look like that. So, my, my working example is the Zero MQ community, which I'm, I'm part of and very proud to be part of which is the second case. It's a self-organizing competitive market of teams and the software they make looks like that. If you put this all together, what this means is that if your job is making software today, which it is, we're all programmers here, 
if you can't end in the in 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 the the happy scenario of building successful decentralized systems, then tomorrow you have no job. Right? Does anyone dispute this? We agree with this. We have, we have the, the cost gravity, Moore's law. The number of computers keeps growing. We have the fact that they must be connected somehow together. We have the fact that the connections must be somehow not serial, they must be parallel, this must work in parallel, otherwise we can't scale. We must scale, otherwise we can't compete. And if we can't compete, someone else will compete against us. So, you know, jobs are a matter of competition. And if we want to make that kind of software, we must look like that as organizations. So this is what I will talk about today, is how to organize yourself and your colleagues and your teams to be effective in a decentralized, decoupled, distributed world. Okay, so like last year, when you have questions, raise your hand. Just you will have no microphones. It's a small room. We'll just shout and talk. Don't be afraid to interrupt me. Okay. We'll start with one question from the audience. Somebody is disagreeing with what I'm just what I'm saying here. No, it's too early in the morning. Okay. Do you want seats? Because there are still places there. But no. Okay. So. How many of you have meetings in your work? If you have a meeting every day or every week, raise a hand. Okay, so the, the vast ma Does anyone not have meetings at work? Okay, the lucky few have no meetings at work. Okay. So when you have a meeting, why are you having a meeting? Have you asked this question to yourself? Why? Who enjoys the meetings? Let's, let's ask that one. Who finds meetings constructive and positive? No people. One, a few people at the back. Okay. So you're born administrators. You're, 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 you're born for middle management. No. Okay. Certain kinds of meetings are fun. This is a meeting here, and this is fun. And this evening will be a meeting, and it's going to be fun. In the fun meetings, we don't actually plan anything. We exchange ideas. We, we brain, brainstorm. We have a beer or two, or we don't. Depends on time of day. We have a coffee. We exchange problems, most definitely. But we don't, make, we don't make firm plans. Or if we make plans, they're just they're speculative. That's a fun meeting. A boring meeting, a terrible meeting, a, a brain-destroying meeting is one where you sit to some, listen to somebody explaining what's going to happen and drawing out the schema of you know, the next week's work and organizing the work. Who enjoys this process of being told what to do? Very few people. Isn't that surprising? And yet, who gets told what to do by their bosses and their colleagues? Pretty much everybody. So there's this very strange phenomenon where we are all trained to do things we don't like doing. And we're all trained to ignore our consistent feelings of distaste and this is not healthy for me, this is not what I enjoy doing, this is not why I began hacking on computers. Computers are fun and yet I'm spending my time unhappy. This is a very important thing to, to, to pick up on and feel and to react upon and to not just sit there and accept it in general. Okay. The reason why the meetings are annoying and distressing is because they're actually inefficient and they actually make you a worse developer and they actually harm your career. And accepting to be trained to do things that are bad for you is what makes, you, what makes it painful and hurtful. And the reason why meetings are bad or inefficient is because they are serialization points. Now you say you're, you're, you're an independent actor You've been trained, you're intelligent, you've been selected, you've been hired, you're paid, you're encouraged, and then you're told to stop and wait for 10 minutes, for one hour. It doesn't matter. You're being told to wait. And it's very much like we have this computer with 40 cores. It's a supercomputer. This, this is a great computer. It's, it feels very good about itself. It's a very happy computer. It's got lots of cores, and it's running this very concurrent software, and then it wants to get a lock, a lock on something, a global lock, and all 40 cores stop and wait for one thread to stop and finish its work and they can get a lock and then they can all carry on again. And during that time, your 40, the 40 cores are just idle. Nothing happens. CPU use, zero. Wait time, infinite. The lock could take a second, it could take a microsecond, it could take a day. No one knows that's a meeting. Okay, the meeting is full of people waiting to be released to actually do their real work. Okay? And if you have in your process, if you have one hour meeting a day, you have an eight hour day, one hour, that's 12%. That means that you're now hitting 
Amdahl's law, your maximum team size is going to be eight people. That's it. And after that, you cannot get more, you cannot get more, more efficient, you can't be more productive after eight people. So if you have a team of 12 people or 13 people or 20 people doing one hour meeting a day, you're at 50% total waste. That's ignoring other kinds of waste. You just simply can't scale. This is very important things to understand. Can you remove that meeting? Yes, you can. How do you remove that meeting? Ah, you change a lot of the organization. Who has to get approval before they can start on work? Approval for budget or direction or anybody? You can all work freely or you have to get approval from your bosses or something. Most people get approval. Who, who in their team has to agree on things like the language they're going to use before they can start programming? Like you have to have agreement on which programming language, right? You're a, you're a Scala team, you're a Java team, you're a PHP team, right? That's how it works, right? Do we have, have to have approval on the editors we use? Like are we an Emacs team or a Vim team? Less, yeah? We realize that was stupid, okay? So we have freedom of editors at least, and a little bit more and more operating systems. So we can at least use Linux and Ubuntu instead of having to use brain-dead systems like Windows. Okay, so there's a bit of improvement there. But the choice of language, have you thought about that? Like that upfront agreement on we are uh, this team, we have to all adopt this common culture. And if you don't quite get the culture, you can't really participate. This is extremely expensive. It's actually a, a very significant serialization process. And it's only there because we have very poor ways of connecting pieces. You know, you work on something, you plug it into a bigger system, and that interface is going to be a fuzzy, set of strange calls which are very poorly abstracted. So your work can't be really delivered in any kind of abstract form. That's the kind of standard default case. And that's why we have to rely on language as our common culture to make that go away. If you can move to a more contract-based approach where you implement contracts which are simple and well-defined, then no one cares what language you use. Do you care what language Google is written in? to check your email. No, you don't care. Do you care, you know, Google, Google search is using Go or using C or using Java, do you care? No, you don't care. Because a contract is very simple. It goes over HTTP and there's a, there's a web thing that pops up and you type in some stuff, you press enter. That's a simple contract. The language is irrelevant. If you can use that approach in your work, then, the, then you remove a very important need for consensus, a very costly need for consensus. So the lesson we've learned in our research of how to build very decentralized organizations is that upfront consensus is bad. And this is the conclusion of Conway's law, all the rest, is that upfront consensus is actually toxic. It may sound like a good thing. Let's get agreement. It's a terrible thing. So keep this in mind. This is today's lesson. It's like the number one thing. Try to eliminate upfront consensus. By that I mean try to eliminate the need to agree with people, your colleagues, your bosses, your clients, on what you're going to do before you do it. You can agree on problems, absolutely. You can agree on priorities of what you're trying to solve in terms of, of, of problems. But agreeing on how you're going to solve those problems is expensive and it's, it's, it's inefficient and it causes serious, serious costs. Let me give you an example of this. We have this process in ZeroMQ where we, we do everything with pull requests, right? Everything is a pull request always. And traditionally, when you get a pull request from somebody, you review the code. And you say, is this pull request quality code or is it not quality code? Because, you know, we're going to merge onto master, so it has to be very good, right? So we look at the pull request and we criticize the indentation and the variable names and we ask the person what they're doing and why it's like that. And then after about five days or, I don't know, the, the, this person goes away in disgust, of course, and then maybe we merge and maybe we don't. So I've, I teach, I teach my, my maintainers to merge immediately. Pull request comes in, we have a competition to see who can merge the fastest. Ah, but Peter, does it, break, does it break tests? I'm like, I don't really care. Let's say it breaks tests. Merge it anyway. Oh, we've broken master. I'm like, good, now we know it's broken. Merge it. Merge it. Merge it. And I'll see, you do this quite often. You have people discussing. I turn my back, I come to Serbia for two days, and some, some guys are discussing it on, 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 a, on a pull request, and they're going through, and I'm like, oh, discussion, merge the patch quickly. And you merge the patch, discussion goes away. It's not that people stop thinking, it's they stop, they stop thinking about the wrong thing. Now, if they don't like the patch, what do they do? They make a new patch. 
So this assumption that we have to agree before we can merge is a wrong assumption. It turns out to be completely bogus. It's just a lie. We've received this somehow by, by listening to experts who knew what they're talking about. They're, they're wrong. The reality is that you can merge a bad patch, you can merge a broken patch, you can merge it, you can fix it much faster and more accurately than if you have to agree up front to only merge correct patches. This is counterintuitive and we've learned in our industry that we can only accept quality code. It's a lie. It's a lie. Bad code is actually as good as good code in terms of getting people to work together. And it doesn't need consensus. If you accept to merge anything, you don't need consensus. You simply merge and then if it's irritatingly bad code, you go and fix it. And if it's not, you leave it. Let's say you broke a test that no one cares about. It can remain broken. Let's say you broke a contract that no one cares about. Fine. So the very fact that it broke something can be also good. And this is science. You'd have experiments. Experiments fail. So again, trying to stop failure, trying to resist failure, and trying to build perfection is, again, it's a lie. You have to build systems which can fail, where failure is part of the learning process. And the only way to get con perfection is to get upfront consensus. And it's, 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 an, it's an illusion. And the illusion breaks apart as you get bigger and bigger organizations. Okay? So who, who, who's familiar with the actor model? It's becoming well known, right? The Erlang actor model, the actor model? No? It's still only a few of you? Okay. So your homework for today, please, is to go onto Wikipedia and just read the page on the actor model. That's it. It's not big. The actor model is not very complex. What it basically is a, a model for behavior of pieces of a decentralized system. And like many of the good things in computer science, it's quite old, like me. And it's accurate, because these truths don't have to be radically new to be accurate and be, and be still relevant. And it solves the problem of building very large-scale decentralized systems. And it does it in the right way. It's basically, it basically describes how to build systems where there is no upfront consensus. Okay, let's, let's ask him one more question. Who here, who, what do you prefer? Do you prefer checking your email and answering emails as they come in, or do you prefer going to uh, your to-do list and do what's been on your to-do list? What do you prefer? Who's, who's in favor of to-do list? And who prefers answering their emails? Emails, me. Emails are events, right? They come in, they're prioritized, you keep your inbox empty, and as people send you stuff, you answer it. It's very lazy. No emails, no stress. Sometimes getting some spam is nice because it teaches you that your, your email's still working, right? Get some spam, delete it, that's great. And if anything is urgent, you'll get an email, right? It's, it's an elegant way of working. I like this personally. It's very lazy. I mean, the only downside is you have no holiday, you have no weekends. But it's a, it's a trade, right? In exchange for that, you have like a smooth, reactive lifestyle. I love that. Uh, having to get up at 8 o'clock, okay, for, I mean, for a conference to see you people is fantastic. But normally, it's, I would rather just stay in bed a bit longer and then, you know, let my day flow around my events rather than have to get up and do work that's been planned for me and go through this kind of mechanical process of pushing myself to, to work on stuff. So this is the core of an actor model is a reactive, intelligent unit, which is what we all are. Stuff happens, the unit responds, unit goes back to sleep and waits on, just on more events. Okay? What flows between these units are messages. Messages conform to certain contracts. They're not just random blobs of data, they're data with a certain structure, a certain semantic, they have meaning, they have a certain syntax. If you have random garbage data, you throw it out. So when you get unparsable data, you ignore it. That's fair. Individual actors can fail at any point in time. People will leave the room here, they will come back, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect what happens in the room. You can add more actors to this kind of system at any point in time. You can add more and more actors. And it scales in a perfect line. Why? Because actors share no state. So Amdahl's law applies with the 0% serial, 100% parallel. You can keep adding actors, it will keep scaling. So in your work, 
see yourselves as independent, able to, you should be able to self-organize, you should be able to understand what problems are worth working on every day. You should be able to motivate yourself by looking at interesting problems. And you should be aware of when things are painful for you in your work, it's a sign that they should be changed. And to be honest, it's difficult to change the way we work. I've spent much of my life arguing with my management, that's why I work as an independent finally, about how to do things. And things that seem obvious are for other people very difficult to understand often. It doesn't matter. You have lots of time in your lives. But do accept that when things are painful for you and they seem to be wrong, that you have the power to change them. You think about them carefully. Think about why it's not efficient. Look to the laws for of physics for inspiration if you want. Or send me an email and I'll try to help you. And then make your life better by changing things when we're independent. Okay? So I think we're going to stop it there. I hope you're awake now. Uh, I want to have a big round of applause for the organizers, for Boyana and Dusan and the team, because they did a really, really good job. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, coding Serbia. Yay.